Sunday, and I won't be getting to bed until probably 10:30, 11 o'clock, you know, or the earliest on Sunday. So that's going to be the length of day uh, that's going to uh, happen over the weekend. So we'll see how the filming schedule goes. We'll see how everything gets out there. Uh, because we are going into the weekend, this is going to be the last episode for the week. So Friday's episode is, is going to be the last episode for the week. And then we just sort of push forward uh, on the weekend. The weekend is going to be one uh, episode. So uh, we'll, catch up, we'll catch up on our uploading and everything like that. I know everything's kind of behind. And you try to catch up. You try to 
do as much as you can to get things back into a normal schedule, but that's the way things are. This is kind of like the, my first week of school, where everything's new, there's a lot of new stuff to get done, a lot of new, a lot of new stuff to get used to, and this is what I kind of feel like, as I said, I feel like I, 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 I'm still in that uh, tween mode. And that I never get to a point where I'm comfortable with what I'm doing, uh, and as soon as I do ha I get to that point, uh, then it automatically switches back and I'm in a, in a, in a position in, in a uh, area that, that I'm not comfortable with. And I have that sort of uh, excited feeling that you're in a new area, in, in, in something new. But also you have the anxiety because it is new and unknown and you're not, and you're not the best at it. So and I, think, but I think I'm over the part where you have to be the best. I don't really care whether I'm the best. It's a, it's a matter of pushing forward and learning and doing something a little different. And this show has done that. This show has pushed me into something a little different. Now I'm pushing forward and seeing what more can be done. So this is the whole thing that I've got the show done more or less. We're in the new. We're getting into the new format. This new format, the uh, reality show format, is uh, going off on a more regular basis. Uh, I've got my reading room more or less set back up and. Here's one of the other books I, I, I like reading and that uh, I read uh, and eventually will be involved in here. This is Flat and Curse Space Time. The, uh, I started with uh, this book. The book that kind of started everything that sort of gave me the idea to set up my own uh, research facilities is this book here called The Cosmic Code of Quantum Physics as the, as the Language of Nature. And this is the book that uh, got everything started. Yeah, so this is it. This is the book that got everything started. And basically my entire thesis, everything uh, I based my research off of came off of here. And as I basically followed uh, something known as the random walk. So the random walk and this book is the basis of, of uh, what I'm doing here. And I'm sure, of course, I'm saying, here, here you go, uh, we got the book Wide Awake at 3 o'clock at, at, at 3 a.m. And you can see that uh, this does have a factor uh, on what we do. Talks about jet lag and everything like that. We get into the, uh, uh, the more physiological aspects of it when we talk about uh, melatonin, serotonin, and all the different uh, 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 chemicals and neurochemicals in the brain that affect sleep. Uh, and so we, we can get into the physiology of sleep. And there are some interesting aspects to, to, to the physiology of sleep that we still can and should go into as the days roll on. But it's a, we took a little bit of a break from that uh, because uh, we are sort of just uh, uh, feeling our chops around here, trying to get things into a good order. And then once we get things into a good order, I think maybe Monday, we'll get back into the physiology of sleep as the first segment, and then we'll continue on from there. Uh, if you'd like to see uh, uh, anything as a segment uh, that you think maybe I'm missing in science that I should be doing, uh, we, uh, let me know in the comments, and then uh, uh, try to see if we can put it in there, right? See if it's part, if it's part of uh, the regular routine. So, yeah, don't forget that I will be at... at uh, Ubuntu BSD Unix Atel is, is uh, now rolled into here, along with Cyborgs and Cybernetics. It's all part of uh, Big Bang CRRL now. So, and you'll see a number of components will be rolled into here, uh, but there will be other components that are sort of left uh, in the Y and Z components of uh, the Big Bang CRRL. So, that's it for today, for, not to say for, uh, for this segment, and I will see you in the next segment. Eh, in about uh, two to three hours. All right, probably at the editing desk. Take it easy. Yeah, it's uh, basically 2.30 in the morning here at the editing desk. Uh, it's Friday. Yeah. End of the week. And uh, I came to the editing desk just around 1 o'clock and began to edit uh, the episode for... August 28th and 29th. That's a sort of a, a two days much together. Uh, that's because I was there for chemises uh, and chemises. Uh, when you go to church, it does take a fair bit of time over the two days, and it's a rather big celebration. So 
uh, two days were kind of morphed together. And <laughs> the way it ended up going is that the week, uh, over the weekend, uh, being Greek, uh, there's a Greek wedding. So I'm going to my big, my, my big fat Greek wedding. If any of you have seen that movie, that's uh, the type of wedding that I'm going to. So that's going to take up a large chunk of the weekend as well. And basically, something like that goes on just about every week. And there's there there is some sort of function or uh, uh, family thing that uh, that ends up taking up a, a fair chunk of time in addition to going to church. So the study schedule, the work schedule, ends up getting stretched out because I do work in between these different different events. And then when you're going, when I'm going to church. Because in Greek, it's my opportunity to study uh, the Greek language and sort of see it not from a textbook perspective, but see it from a, a real-life usage situation, and that gives me a, a, a sort of a leg up or a better understanding of the Greek language than if I had simply gone through a textbook and simply uh, had a textbook understanding of Greek. So. That's kind of where I see things and uh, how I like things. That's, it kind of fits with my life. And so, yeah. Um, it's taken me about an hour and a half, going back to the editing stuff here, it's taken me about an hour and a half to edit everything. It started at 1 and it's now 2.30. And that's about an hour and a half worth of work to uh, edit uh, the one episode. But it's about 20 minutes in length. So yeah, I said, we're just about the getting there. I'm, I'm still trying to work out how to sort of uh, meter out the uh, length of time spent in each episode. Uh, that's still a little rough for me. Uh, the editing is getting better, getting easier. Um, uh, normally, uh, I'm not finishing and getting to the rendering part until much later on. Uh, so I'm, I'm at the rendering a lot earlier than I was before. So uh, yeah, everything seems to be going well, it seems to be progressing well, and this makes things uh, easier, and as I get more in the rhythm of things, uh, I'm going to be able to do more. So that's how we'll leave it for now, and I will see you in the next segment. I'm going to try to vlog right to the end of the day. Well, at the end of my day. <laughs> Alright, take it easy. Another person that I go by on a regular basis to on YouTube is a girl, her, her name is uh, Mary Claire, and she has her YouTube channel, uh, Trust Me I'm Weird, but she's also Forever Your Nerds, uh, and she has another one called Trust Me I'm Portable, and she's a bit of a quirky egg, and I seem to like the quirky egg types. Uh, that's my preference. There's a whole variety of types of YouTubers out there. And, you know, a lot of the guys are doing their standard guy humor and so on and so forth. And that includes uh, uh, Shane Dawson, whose uh, comments are rather, um, well, they're not to my taste, let's put it this way, his, his videos. And my tastes are more along the lines of the quirky eggs. But, of course, when you run into these quirky eggs, they are going to have issues. They're going to have their point of view and their weirdness, which is uh, part of what makes them uh, fun and interesting people. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you agree with everything that they do or, or everything that they say, and uh, typically you leave uh, the, the, their opinions alone uh, because simply don't want to rain on their parade. At some point in time, though, if the uh, the uh, the opinions keep coming out and that this is part they are, they are, in some cases they are opinionated people, then you have to find a tactful way of saying, well, yes, you are entitled to your opinion, it's great that you have your opinion, but it's your opinion and I have my opinion. And, uh, she has recently, and as most quirky people do, and sort of run into these situations, is a typical product of the indoctrination that is going on in the schools vis-a-vis -vis the uh, socialist issues, and this is talking about um, things like global warming and uh, all those touchy-feely uh, socialist issues, uh, that really, when you look at them carefully, uh, 
realize that they are indoctrination because they haven't been told everything that they need to know and really to make what they call an informed decision or an informed choice. So rather than titling this, and this is going to be separate uh, in addition to being part of Big Bang Theory, well, this is going to be entitled Gay Mythology. Because she's talking about gay marriage. And what she doesn't understand is that uh, because a large chunk of what socialism is and claims to be has not been proven, and actually in many cases has been proven false, uh, it is no longer the de facto, based on science fact, that it, that it pretends and claims to be. It is yet another religion, and as, such, uh, as its religion, it has its own myths and mythologies. And inside of this uh, mythology of uh, homosexuality, there is the idea and the mythology that uh, homosexuals are born this way. Well, if you understand psychology from the perspective, and you really understand that it is, uh, from its original term, psychologia, uh, meaning uh, study of the soul, then you understand that the soul, which is not part of the physical body, can become ill in just the same manner that the physical body can become ill. And all you have to do is take a look at mentally ill people on the streets, and you can see this. And men, one of the key components to mentally ill people is that in many cases they don't feel themselves to be diff any, any different in, in, so in society from other people and their complaints are often that uh, they are mistreated because they are different. And yeah, that's many cases. People who are different are mistreated. I mean, I've been mistreated a large chunk of my life because I am different. I don't follow a standard mold. And people treat me as different as such. Uh, that hasn't really affected or uh, prevented me from doing what I want in life, though. Other people, it becomes a major stumbling block. It becomes an issue. They feel, and this is, you see this in movies over and over again from even back in the 1980s when you have the movie Revenge of the Nerds, that everyone has to be all-inclusive. We have to accept all in, uh, one another. And the thing is, you don't have to accept one another. People are going to have different choices and different points of view. And then, of course, there's always... If you're talking about the larger sense of society, and you're talking about laws, and why something is legal and not legal, and that's because there are consequences for changing the laws. There, there are consequences beyond your own interest. And you have to look at these consequences for these changes uh, in, in order to say whether something should or shouldn't be illegal, or how something should and shouldn't be treated within the law, or not within the law. And this becomes the issue of gay marriage. Uh, gay marriage is one of those things now that everyone's saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. Why can't two people love each other? Well, because marriage, as it's defined, is a very quirky thing. It's a very dangerous thing because the Christian standard of marriage is not the only standard out there. There have been, throughout the thousands of years of human history, of mul a multitude of different standards, including brother and sister sibling marriages where the two brother and sister love each other and they get married and have children. Well, we know biologically and genetically what happens. We know that there are genetic defects. There's no, we know there's deformities. There's a whole number of issues, the uh, biological, biological issues that pop up when a brother and sister marry. This is true when a father and daughter marry, or a mother and a brother. In other words, you cannot be marrying someone even even though you love them within your own family because there is a genetic. Uh, a genetic consequence to this. But yet, although this is for, for most of uh, civilized society, there's, there's been a law against intermarriage between brother and si between sister, there, this has not stopped this from going on in history. All you have to do is look at, take a look at the sister of, of uh, look, look at the uh, city of Philadelphia. They call it the, the, the city of brotherly love. But if you know the Greek, and you know the Greek where, where the word comes from, then it's not, you know that the, uh, the, word, the, the Philadelphia is not the city of brotherly love. It's the sister of sisterly love. Which feeling means it is aimed at a girl. Right? It, 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 it's love of girl, right? So Philadelphia is the girl. And I think the reason why it's named that, and I do have to go back to my Greek and fix that up. Sorry about that. Uh, is because uh, back in, in Egypt, when the Greeks were running Egypt, in order to keep um, the throne in the proper hands and the proper dynasty, you had brothers marrying sisters. 
And so, it, 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 matter of fact, you know, this whole joke about uh, 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 the southern folk or, or, or hicks, the hillbillies marrying each other in terms of marrying their own kin. Well, this is something that was very royal. It was almost a royal standard to marry someone with, within your own family in order to keep the dynasty going. It was also true that uh, kings, in terms of their marriage, had concubines, had many different wives, in order to keep the, uh, the, uh, the, the bloodline, the, the royal line going. If the wife couldn't have an heir, the male heir then, that they needed, then he would go out to one of the many different mistresses, the various the, the, the concubines. These were his own personal uh, toys that he would play with sexually, and uh, that's how he would father his heir to the throne. And so, and the thing is that if you know, and this goes back again to history, you would go into the Hebrew society, and you'll understand that bar mitzvah is when uh, a, a man turns into a, a girl, a, man, a boy turns into a man, and there's the bas mitzvah where a girl turns in, in, into a woman. And this is at the age of 12 and 13. Well, the thing is, is that at 12 and 13, back in the old agrarian standard, it was legal for for for, uh, for parents to give away their daughters at the age of 13 to older men to provide for them. Now, this is something that we would call in today's society as pedophilia, but it's out there, and in fact, it still it still exists in India today. In India today. If you go and look up the issue of, this, of, of a group of people called Dalits, you will find that it's, it, that it is legal and it's still practiced today that Dalits, uh, uh, their children, as young as three years old, their girls, as young as three-year-olds, can be betrothed and taken by a husband who is maybe 50, 60 years old. So, so this practice of giving your children or taking children and marrying them off in arranged marriages is not something that has disappeared, and it still exists. But as I can imagine, if all these different things, these different standards of marriage, now have to become legal, because you said to one group, like the homosexuals, that yes, we will permit your marriages, even though it is morally against our 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 our, our, our founding constitution. See, our Constitution, the American Constitution uh, that exists today, is based on Christian, on, on Christian fundamentalism. And I'm not talking about the Christian fundamentalism of the Christian right. Most Christians who exist today exist based on Christian theology that has started 1000 AD and on. So in other words, uh, most Christian theologies exist uh, and began a thousand years after Christ. And most of them actually contradict what Christ initially taught. For example, if you look at and go back into the Roman Catholic, the Crusades, which uh, created Christian armies and had Christian knights and had uh, uh, Christian monks leading raids on cities and killing scores of people in these Crusades. And you go back to the original uh, uh, Gospel of Christ and the original Church of Christ, you will find that the, that this concept of holy war was something that was considered barbaric and wrong. It was sinful at the time, and that this view of holy war was something called a it was called a heresy. So much so that the original Christian church, this is where you have the split in the church between East and West. The East non-European Christian church stayed with the old church, stayed with the old belief. And the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, brought in a church that was based on hierarchy, based on uh, kings and queens, based on brutality. And the Eastern Church, the non-European Church, viewed this European Church, this Western European Church, as an anti-Christian church. This is how far the views were from each other, because Christ didn't get get out, come off the Christ, come off the cross, and slaughter everyone in revenge for. Uh, his crucifixion, crucifixion, he stayed and said, and stayed peacefully on the cross, and let the people kill him. And this was true of all the Christian martyrs for for the for the first 800 years. 
Christian martyrdom was about Christians who being executed simply for their belief, but not fighting back. They kept their belief. They didn't. Re they refused to give up their belief, but they didn't fight. They weren't violent. And there was a whole as a Christian, as a Christian, as an original Christian, this thousand years is now completely gone. It's been completely erased in history. Uh, a large chunk was done by the Catholics. A large, then another chunk was done by the Muslims. Uh, to initially wipe out the entire history, uh, a thousand year history of the Middle East that was actually Christian and not not Muslim. Uh, so those who call themselves Christian today, the fundamentalism, uh, and they talk about hating uh, homosexuals and stuff like that, that's not Christian. And this is not where our, our, our Constitution comes from. It's not fundamentally Christian in terms of the Christian feminine. It comes back from the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta looks back to pre-Norman England. That's prior to 1000 A.D. In pre, prior to 1000 A.D., uh, England did not follow European Christianity. It followed non-European Christianity. And it was considered to be part of the non-European uh, Christian uh, churches. And that included... The non-European Christian church included Africa, it included Syria, it included Jerusalem, it included Turkey, what was present-day Turkey, or, or Asia Minor, and it stretched all the way into India. The ancient church stretched all the way into India. And you can see the outgrowth as different philosophies, different ideas, different theologies came forward. They all brought forward some different standards of marriage. It was only in the Christian marriage, in the, in the first part of the Christian marriage, the first Christianity, that women, men and women were equal. Men and women in the Byzantine Empire, uh, prior to uh, the European, the rise of the European sphere, there were men and women doctors. There were, uh, in the church, the figures that, that people looked up to. Not only were there the fathers, but they were the mothers too. There is, there is many mothers in the early Christian church as there were fathers. There were fathers who looked up to the mothers. And so what happens, it wasn't a lopsided, male-dominated hierarchy that we see today. But the thing is, we live in an age of consequences, where if we went immediately and just threw out the laws, and this is what happens, and this is where socialism comes in. Socialism throws the laws of society into two forms of chaos, either anarchy or nihilism. Uh, anarchy is the more violent form that destroys everything and is active in its destruction, and nihilism is a more peaceful form of, of, of uh, anarchy, of uh, formlessness. But either one, both nihilism and anarchy, uh, lead to dictatorships. This is the way it's been in history always in every case when socialism has popped up, you've had the anarchists and you've had the nihilists come up, they, they wipe out the, they become the counterculture, they wipe out the standard culture, and then in comes the totalitarian governments like Hitler, Stalin, both of those were socialists, uh, Paul Pot of uh, the Khmer Rouge, he was socialist, and then when you start seeing what ends up happening, the, the consequences of what happens, you begin to see that you know, you can't just simply toss out a law because someone disagrees with it or it's not fair to somebody else. You have to approach the situation of legal and not legal in a manner that if somebody wants their rights, that you have to actually have a standard in the law that can deal with negative consequences of these laws, even if someone brings up on these negative consequences themselves. And uh, to give you an idea of this and how this consequence actually uh, comes about is that uh, there has been an attempt to find genetic links to homosexuality. I have seen them from the journal Science. Uh, journal Science uh, has never been able to produce this journal. That, that This is where all the lab reports go. There has been no successful study that has ever found the genes uh, for homosexuality. None of it's been successful. So the view of homosexuality being born with it as being something natural is a myth. Is a myth. It's part of the, homosexuality, the homosexual mythology.
As for uh, people loving each other, yes, people can love each other, but you're supposed to love each other as brother and sister. If, if you have another girl who's next to you, you love the girls have a, an a girls can go dance with each other, they can hold hands, they can kiss each other, and this is part of a girl's affection. What homosexuality does, and this can be seen for both boys and the girls, is homosexuality sexualizes the what's supposed to be affection and turns affection into a sexual, a sexual experience, a sexuality behavior. Uh, and this is what in many cases causes a person as you go from encounter to encounter, encounter to encounter trying to find your happiness in life it always eludes you because you're never, never able to well if if a feeling is sexual that feeling of affection that you're desiring never comes back and this can become devastating particularly to girls and this is where a large chunk you see that there's a lot of unhappiness and to underscore the unhappiness that adults feel uh, adults are very depressing uh, it is also true that most adults now uh, from the age uh, even 45 on up or 40 on up uh, it, 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 which is in terms of the lifespan not that old uh, a large chunk of, of society most adults are on some form of mood altering medication they are on so fundamentally unhappy with us, so fundamentally depressed that they are on some form of antidepressant. And this is not something that's good to go into in terms of your health or any other things. Uh, on a spiritual level, if you were believe that you're a spiritual person, there's a consequence to this as well. Because if you look even, let's say, not at the Christian uh, Christian uh, spiritual belief, but says that it's wrong, and not, it's not just because it's wrong, because if you go back into the text, the original text, and you start reading what's going on, what they say in Greek, which is where the original text comes from, you'll find they talk about spiritual death, that homosexuality, in addition to sexuality on its own, leads to the spiritual death. This same sentiment comes up not only in Buddhism, but it comes up in Hinduism. You talk to, and I've talked to many Hindu families who are primarily conservative uh, from the old country, and they are very much against uh, homosexuality because it destroys the family. Most Indians, most Chinese, any, any uh, foreign uh, person who comes from a cultural background of family, Homosexuality is viewed as a strong negative, as a taboo, because it destroys the family. And they also view it, if you go into their religious text, they view this as homosexuality as something known as the left-hand path. The path to darkness. The left-hand path is the path to darkness, away from lightness, away from nirvana, away from spiritual enlightenment. And so the question is, when you uh, have these homosexual feelings, which can be dealt with, even though most psychologists who are failed and contradict themselves on a regular basis, uh, to the point that homosexuality as a feel itself really doesn't exist, because it's fundamentally contradicted itself. Uh, it can be said that homosexuality can be dealt, homosexuality can be dealt with psychologically, it can be dealt with spiritually, and a person can be brought back to a more normal sense of lifestyle. Assuming that this is what the person wants, this is the path that they want to go down, then it is, it's not that it's going to be an easy path, it's, it's just that it's going to be uh, a path that can be followed, that can be achieved. Uh, it really depends on this is what you want to do. Uh, if you are homosexual and choose and believe you have a spirit, we have a soul. The question is for other people and how it affects other people. When you want to bring somebody else in, like let's say you have somebody you love and you want them, want them to become homosexual and they're not homosexual, but you want them to be homosexual so that you can have a relationship with them. And you're supposedly, let's say, that, let's say you actually, actually have not that condition, but you have another person who is homosexual willingly homosexual and you want to have that relationship with them. 
If you love the person, do you want that person to, spir to, have the, the, to spiritually die? Do you want to destroy their soul? Is this a, something that's going to make you happy down the road as a consequence of the action you're taking now? If love, the true form of love, is about what you sacrifice for somebody else, and making sure that somebody else, the person you love, is happy and has a better life or has the things that they want, and this is the form of true love, then seeking to destroy somebody for your own sense of gratification, that's not true love. That's selfishness. That's lust. It's not love. And the thing is, in today's society, in the indoctrination that goes on in school, in schools, they're bringing more and more, and you can see this in, on a daily basis, they're sexualizing children in school. They're turning them into whores. They're turning them into uh, what they call sexual beings. And there are a lot of people who believe, a lot of people believe, particularly in the educators, that, that people are sexual beings. And it's their job to bring teenagers and kids into this sexual world, into their sexual being. This is the goal that they have. And then you need to decide whether this is for you or not. And I, is it, I don't follow the mainstream. I, are, I, I, are, I say stand up for yourself. I say question what people are telling you. I don't tell you, you know, just believe what I say. Go and check it out. And I'm also saying that when someone else tells you something, Go check it out. Go look further and see what, what, if what they're telling you is true or not. See if they're telling you if, if it's indoctrination. If you are not allowed to question what they're teaching you, if you cannot ask fundamental and strong opposing questions and they get angry at it, then you're looking at indoctrination. If you're forced to an assembly with no rebuttal to what's being said in the assembly, that's indoctrination. And more often than not, when you're indoctrinated into the mythology of homosexuality or, in, or the mythology of socialism, there's an enormous amount of lies in there. And the question is, what do you want to do with your life? And this isn't something that, that says, I, I, I want you to be a bad person, or I, 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 I hate you or anything like that. This is about questioning and finding your own path to happiness. And it can be done. You know, everyone takes their own path. I took an individual path. I'm an individual. I've never conformed to anything in my life. Still don't. And I've found a path of happiness. So it can be done. It just depends on what you want. All right. So that's about it for the, this segment. Uh, is it? You're going to be able to watch this either in Big Bang Theory URL or you can watch it separate as a, as a separate, uh, as a separate uh, comment why. All right. Take it easy. Free speech rules here at Democratic Earth.